All right, we might make a start. Um, so um, you might remember, hopefully remember, that um, last week we spoke about um, how a generator works. So how a generator is basically just a loop of wire that we're spinning with respect to a magnetic field. So sometimes the magnetic field lines are completely missing the, the loop. Sometimes they're passing through, sometimes they're missing again, and sometimes they're passing through in the opposite direction. Um, so what that creates is a magnetic flux, which has sort of a sinusoidal shape to it. And because um, our EMF is um, all about the rate of change of that um, flux, that means we get a sinusoidal uh, voltage inside the loop. Uh, so a voltage which is driving electrons one way around the loop and then back around the other way. And we had two choices about how we were going to connect onto that generator. We could use a commutator, just like we did with the DC motor. And that would, just like it does with the DC motor, flip the current every half turn. And that would have the effect of keeping this in the circuit, in the external circuit, keeping this voltage from ever going negative. So it would keep it from all it would keep it always positive, and that would mean it would be um, a form of DC electricity, direct current electricity, um, even though it would be varying in strength. But our other option was to use um, slip rings, which I know is a very similar term, but it means something completely different. So when we connect to our generator using slip rings, we get just a direct connection to that EMF that's inside the loop, which means what we get in our external circuit is AC electricity, alternating current electricity. And that is, now I conceive of it, even though it's called alternating current, I conceive of it as an alternating potential. So it's a, it's an electric field which keeps on changing directions and that causes the electrons to get pushed one way and then the other and then one way and then the other. So you can imagine electrons going back and forth down, um, down the wire and never really going anywhere. Just kind of moving back and forth on the spot. But just because they're not going anywhere or on average doesn't mean that they're not able to do work as they move back and forth. So as they go back and forth through our current, through our circuit, they're going to be dropping electricity off, dropping off energy as they go, dropping off voltage. Um, so um, today we're going to talk about just some of the features of that type of electricity, AC, what makes it different, what makes it special, um, how to measure it, that sort of thing. Um, and then we're going to look at um, what are the advantages of using AC in terms of transmission. Um, some of this you'll have already seen in um, some of the Adrolo stuff, um, so it won't be brand, brand new, but it doesn't hurt to hear it a couple of times um, to get it into your head um, and to be able to ask some questions along the way. So please feel free to interrupt me today. Um, don't just let me ramble on um, if you're not understanding something. Um, if you don't want to jump in in the voice chat, sorry, in the um, like physically interrupt me, then please use the other uh, symbols on the on the left to, to raise your hand or say go slow, go fast, etc. Okay, so we have alternating current here, and over time, it's getting stronger and weaker, and then negative and stronger negative and weaker negative, and coming back, and it's going back and forth with this sort of shape here, um, and that presented a bit of a problem for us in terms of saying like, well, what voltage is it? Like what? How strong is this? How do we measure it? And our solution last lesson was to sort of take an average, let me use a slightly different color, an average for each quarter cycle that the generator goes through. And in each quarter cycle, we were able to say the average EMF was given by, say average per quarter is uh, 4N, B A F. So all the factors that go into producing this electricity, um, four that represents the fact that it's a quarter of a full cycle. So it's a quarter of a period. So, and that's the delta T's on the bottom. So 
comes up the top. Um, N, that's how many times we've looped the wire around the loop on, on the generator. B, that's how strong the magnetic field is that we're rotating the generator through. Um, A, that's the area of the loop. And F, that's the frequency that we're spinning this thing at. Um, when we do that, we get something, we get V a quarter or, or V average or EMF a quarter, all sort of similar terms. And that's kind of here-ish. Okay, and so that's like the average value that if you sort of took this, if you just took this total change and just divided it by the amount of time. Um, but that is only a very rough measure of how much voltage you're getting here. There are two other measures that we might be interested in here. And one is sort of fairly obvious. One is that we would really obviously like to know what is this peak? So what is, what is this peak value? And what you might be interested in there is if this signal is going to um, going through a fuse or going through a, um, if going through some sort of electrical component that's fairly sensitive, then the peak value is going to tell you, well, are we going to blow out this thing or not? If we send this signal into a speaker, are we going to blow out the cones on our speaker because we're pushing it too hard? All right. That, that V peak is going to be the important thing there because that's going to be the thing that tells us how much current we're sending down the line at its maximum. But the other thing we might be interested in is something very close to this average, but a different way of taking an average. And I'm going to just going to put that on here without explanation for the moment. And then we can talk about um, afterwards, we can talk about what's going on. So it's, it's somewhere around here. It's another measure of the average and it's called the root mean square average or RMS. Okay, and it's a, it turns out it's a slightly more accurate measure of the average than just sort of taking the total change in flux over the change in time um, for particular purposes. So we'll talk about what those purposes are today and we'll derive what this root mean square thing actually means. Okay, um, so we've got, so we're going to introduce these two measures. So how do we measure it? Our two measures are going to be V peak and V R. M S. Okay. Root mean square. All right. And then lastly, we're going to talk about what happens when we transmit electricity through like a real, um, a real world, uh, transmission system. Um, and the thing to realize there is that when we send things down the lines to our homes, well then what we have here is we have a bunch of resistors in the house. So the house has some effective resistance and that depends on how many different electrical devices you have switched on in the house, how many different parallel circuits you have going on, but your house is, um, Edward has just asked a question that's probably worth saying, um, which is why do we always use a quarter cycle here? Um, why don't we use other, why don't we use, you know, half a third, a full cycle. Um, a quarter is just, it's just the most convenient because it's taking us from zero to the full value. So the, when we do the derivation, it's just going to be, well, this is, this is not a flux graph. This is a, a V graph, but when we do the derivation of the voltage in the first place, we've got that graph of flux versus time. And the two easiest points to look at are going to be the x-intercepts where the flux is zero and the peak where the flux is just B times A. And that's the only reason we use that as our estimate of the average is just because it's convenient. Um, it's not, there's not any, there's not any grand reason. It turns out to be not a bad answer. It turns out to be close to what we actually want. And so we just kind of go with it. Um, but yeah, it's just because it's convenient to calculate. That's the only reason we use this quarter cycle idea. Yeah. Um, okay. So when we, when we're looking at electrical transmission, um, we have our house and the house has a certain amount of resistance 
and we have our generator and this is the symbol we use for a generator of AC electricity um, and that is pumping out some voltage into the system and what we need to understand though is that usually when we draw a circuit like this Obviously, we draw it with square lines and all that sort of stuff. But usually, when we draw a circuit like this, we assume that the only resistance in the circuit is the resistance that we physically put there, the resistor or a transducer, if we're being really technical about it, or a load. Um, and um, that's, that's it's a pretty good approximation in year 11. So in year 11, when we studied this stuff, we studied circuits where we were using wires that were 30 centimeters long. We we're plugging them into a power supply and then we crocodile clip, clipped that wire onto a resistor and we took another crocodile clip back to the power supply. And sometimes we did that with a few different resistors in there, but we were always working with circuits that were like this big, you know, little physically small circuits. And for that sort of circuit, it's a perfectly good approximation to say that the only resistance that's in there is the resistance of the actual resistors that you've got in the circuit. But when we're talking about large scale transmission of very big currents down very long wires, you no longer get to just ignore the resistance of the wires themselves. So that was an approximation we made in year 11. And it's an approximation that you usually do make with electrical circuits on a small scale, but on the largest scales, you can't just ignore the resistance of these wires. These wires have, it's not very much resistance because they're big, thick wires. They're made of pretty good quality copper. Um, they're well insulated. They're um, made as pure as they can be, so on and so forth. They do as good a job as they can, but they're just kilometers and kilometers long. If you think about the trip from, like we create, Victoria creates most of its electricity in the Latrobe Valley, um, which is near Maui. Um, so oh, I don't know if you know where Moe is, near Wilson's Prom. So if you look at a map of Victoria where the little, little sticky outy bit on the right, near there, not quite that far, but near there. So we're talking like 200 kilometers. The electricity comes from where it's produced to where the lion's share of it is used in Melbourne. And that's as the crow flies. So you imagine it goes around mountains and it also splits up and goes to different suburbs and all sorts. You're talking hundreds of kilometers between you in the house using the electricity and in the Latrobe Valley producing the electricity and somehow it's got to get from here to there. And if you just think about how the, the, the total amount of wire it's going through, even if that wire only has a resistance of 10 to the negative seven ohms every meter, by the time you add up hundreds of kilometers of um, wire, you end up with significant resistance in those wires. So what that means is if we were to draw this as an electrical circuit, sort of a bit like, let's just draw like a year 11 circuit here. So it's not a DC supply, but let's, let's sort of approximate it as one. Then what this circuit looks like is here's the resistance of the wires. And here's the resistance of your house. And I'm going to call that load from now on. I'm going to talk about the electricity that you actually want to use as the load. And you're actually in series with those wires. So, and there's also, I suppose the, the return trip, but because they're in, because the, the going there and the coming back are in series with one another, we can treat those as one resistor sort of conceptually just slam them together. And so we can say that the house, the load is in series with the wires. And then of course, there's also other houses, other loads also in series, sorry, in, in parallel to your house. So when that electricity comes into, let's say your street, it gets split up into how many other houses, all in parallel circuits. But all of them are gonna be in series with these wires. So that means any current that you draw through, any current that passes through you is also going to pass through those wires. So that means let's say you're drawing two amps. Let's say you're drawing two amps from 
the uh, from the supply. And let's say the resistance that you're putting up in your house is, I don't know, 200 ohms. And we're producing that electricity at 240 volts, uh, because that's apparently what you want. Um, well, let's say these wires here end up having a resistance of 50 ohms for the whole journey. That's pretty good for hundreds of kilometers worth of wire to only have 50 ohms of resistance. But what the, oh, sorry. I shouldn't say that you're getting two amps there. You're not going to get two amps. You're going to get about one and a bit amps. One, 0 0.9 amps, let's say. We're just approximating here. Well, we can then say, well, how much, how much voltage is going to get dropped on this resistor? And if you remember um, year 11, you'll know that you can say V equals IR and you can measure how much voltage has been dropped across that resistor. And it's going to be I times R. So it's going to be 45 volts. So that means 45 volts out of the 240 you put in is going to get absorbed by that resistance on the way. That's only going to leave you with 195 volts in your house. And the real problem is actually worse than that. So what that means is any device that you've got that's supposed to be running at 240 volts isn't going to work. You're not actually going to get that 240 volts from the, from the, the generator. And that's a problem we have. That's a big problem that you have. So you cannot, so one way of putting this is you cannot put a 240 volt battery in the Latrobe Valley and expect to get 240 volts in your house, hundreds of kilometers away. Okay. What we need to do is, well, there are a couple of different ways we could solve this problem. All right. So when Thomas Edison was touting DC electricity as being the wave of the future um, and trying to get American cities to install it as, uh, as their, um, their primary supply. His idea was that we will have small scale generators around all the suburbs, right? That there'll be, there'll be a generator, there would be a little, um, a little generator down the road from you. So if you could imagine like, the sort of environmental outcry there would be in the suburbs today if they tried to put coal power stations in every suburb. Um, that was that was Thomas Edison's idea. Um, I'm probably being a little bit unfair to him, uh, but that was that was what you'd have to do if you wanted to run an electrical system off off essentially batteries off DC electricity. It turns out AC has a lovely property that's going to let us get around this, but um, I'm going to leave that as a bit of a teaser. We're going to go and look at this. Um, measuring problem first and then we're going to come back at the end and look at, look at how we solve this problem here okay all right okay so let's look at this measurement problem all right if we have some alternating current we can draw it as a sine graph like this and we could talk about what this peak value is here all right and we could say, if we were then going to um, get some, connect this up in a circuit. So let's, um, let me start a new page, sorry. If we were gonna connect this up in a circuit, oh, let me quickly, T, very sharp sign wave there. Um, and let's say these peak values here, the peak amount of voltage that we're putting out is uh, 120 volts, whatever. Okay. And then that's going to be negative 120 volts. All right. So that's going to be our V peak here. V peak equals 120 volts. All right. Well then we could, we could connect this up to a simple circuit and let's keep things very simple. Let's say this circuit has a hundred ohms of resistance and then we can say, what's the current that's going to be passing through that circuit. And we could, we, we won't worry about that issue of the, the wires having resistance and stuff at the moment. So let's just draw current over time 
and we're also not going to worry about weird impedance and strange effects if you're an electronics person we're just going to treat this very simply we're just going to apply ohm's law to this so the current is just going to be the voltage divided by the resistance so we're going to have if we had 1. 120 volts we're going to have 1.2 amps is going to be our peak current and we're going to have something like this. Um, please tell me if I'm going too fast through like year 11 electricity stuff that you don't remember at all. Okay. Um, so we're just using V equals IR. Ohm's law gets us from this to this. Okay. So we're just dividing through by the current. Then if we think about it though, what we really care about with electricity, if we're running an electrical system, what we really care about is not how much voltage we're getting or how much current we're getting. What we care about is how much energy, how much work the machine at the end of the line can do. So let's say this is a, I don't know, this is a heater, this resistor here, how much actual heat are we getting out of it? Right? And what we want to work out there is, power okay now I don't know if you remember from last year but power is well if voltage is the amount of energy per electron and current is the number of electrons that are coming through then if we want just the total amount of energy then what we need is the current multiplied by the voltage the number of electrons multiplied by how much energy each electron is giving us so voltage drop, that's how much energy each electron gives us. Current, that's how many electrons there are. Multiply those two together, you get how much energy we're getting per second. Another way of putting that is we could look at the units and we could say, well, current is in coulombs per second. That's what an amp is. Charge per second. Voltage, that's joules per coulomb. That's what a volt is. We cancel the coulombs and we get joules per second. So we're measuring how many joules of energy this resistor is dropping on us every second. That's what power is. And that's ultimately what you care about when you're running an electric circuit. You're saying, how much energy do I have to work with? How much, how much useful work can I do here? Right, so if we really care about power, then what we wanna do is at every moment, we wanna multiply this graph by this graph. So we want a power graph, okay? And that power graph is, I won't bore you with the details of how you derive this, but it's gonna look something like this. All right, it's always gonna be positive because it's, whenever this is negative, whenever the current's negative, so is the voltage. So negative times negative gives us a positive. And it's gonna have twice the frequency of this guy because even a positive peak is a positive peak, but a negative peak times a negative peak gives us an extra peak, an extra positive peak. So this is, so the period of this graph, that's the period. Okay, so that is, oh, yeah, that's that point there. But, so what we have is this power, which is always positive and which is oscillating. And what we really want is the average amount of power because this is happening like 50 times per second. So we don't even notice that fluctuation. What we really want to know is what is this average here? All right, well, hold on, let's, let's look at what the peak is. What's the peak? The peak is going to be 120 volts times 1.2 amps. So that's going to be uh, 144 watts is the peak amount that we're getting out here, but we're also sometimes getting zero. Okay, so 
what we would like to do is we would like to derive an equivalent amount of voltage, some, some like magical sort of abstract number of voltage, which if we just pumped that in as DC, so if we just replace this generator here with a DC supply, it would give us the equivalent amount of energy. So this, this voltage here would produce this current here, a nice flat current, and that would produce this flat amount of power. All right, so we're looking for a DC equivalent amount of power. Right. With the idea being that the average amount of power we're getting over time from this blue line is the same as the average amount of power we get from this fluctuating green line. Okay. Are you following me so far? This idea, it's, yep. it's, this is one of those ideas that's a little bit sort of like the derivation is hard, but then the what it is in the end is really easy. So, so there is going to be a take home message at the end here. That's really easy to remember. Right? So what we're doing here, how do we find this thing? Well, mathematically what we'd actually do is we, if we want to find the average of a curve, we um, take the area under it and then we divide by the, uh, the width of it to find the average. Right? So conceptually what we're doing here is we're taking the average of the power. Okay, we're taking the average of the power and then we're working backwards to find what the voltage is. But if you think about this, if V is equal to IR, then we can say P is equal to IV. But if I is just V on R anyway, then this is V squared over R. Right now, this is the last time this year where we are ever going to use P equals V squared on R. Don't use this definition of power ever except now. <laughs> So we're going to use it in this derivation and then we're going to forget about it because it's real. it's like, it is the version of, there's lots of different ways to write power. You can write P equals IV. You can write P equals I squared R. If you do the, if you eliminate the V the other way and you can also write P equals V squared on R. This is the way that makes you cause, that causes mistakes. So don't do this, right? Except right now. Okay. So if the amount of power we have, is equal to V squared on R and we're looking for the average amount of power, then what we're looking for is the average of V squared. Okay. So here's what we do. We take the V that we have. We take the graph of V that we have we square all the values. So we're gonna take this graph here and we're gonna square all our values. Let me draw it again so that we have a, a nice clean picture to work with. All right. We take those values and we square them. And when we square them, they all become positive. So this is V, this is V squared. Then mathematically, we take the average of those squared values. So 
They just every microsecond, we take a value, we go all the way up, we add them all together, we divide by the total amount of time, and we get the squared average. And then we take that value and we take the square root of it. Okay, why would we want to do that? So we get the square root of V average squared, and that puts us down about here. Okay, so that's sort of conceptually what's going on here. We take our graph, we square it, we take the average of what we get when we square it, and then we take the square root of that. Well, so what have we done? We've taken the square root of the average of the square. We've taken the root of the mean of the square of the voltage. Okay. So why is that useful? Well, if we plug that value into the power formula, so P equals IV, then that gives us the same amount of power integrated over multiple seconds as what this overall curve gives us. So this root mean square voltage measures the power output or the power equivalence of the EMF. Nope, oh, that's off the screen. Can you move the page a bit up? Yep. Yeah. Thanks, sorry, Jay. So it's a long walk, but you get there in the end. And so this is the thing we want. This is the measure of voltage, which is like the actual average you really want because it's the one that when you plug it in, you put it into P equals IV. Okay, well that becomes P equals V squared on R. And then you wanna average that over time. So what are you doing? You're averaging V squared, right? So to take the average power over time, what you want is the average of V squared. So this root mean square value is the value that you want to use if you're going to plug it in and get a certain amount of power out. So we have something. So let's say this thing here was peaking at 120 volts. You're not going to get 120 volts of power all the time. You're only going to get that for a split second in each cycle. The amount of power you're going to get is less than that. Right, and how, how much less than it is it? It's, it's this value here. Okay, now remember when I said that um, there's a really easy rule coming? There is. For lovely sinusoidal graphs like this, if your voltage is perfectly sinusoidal, then the root mean square voltage is just the peak divided by the square root of two. Okay, and that is, after that very long walk of a derivation, that is pretty much all that's in the BCAA study design in terms of what you need to remember. Okay, so whenever you're dealing with AC electricity, we're gonna assume that it's perfectly sinusoidal. And if you make that assumption, then you can just say that the peak voltage is gonna be related to the uh, RMS voltage by a factor of square root of two. What that means is that the peak power is related to the average power by a factor of a half, right? So the average power we're getting out is going to be half of what you would expect if you were just getting the peak all the time. Okay, so what does that mean? That means um, 
that this value here, this sort of equivalent battery that we would want to put on. So if this generator here has a peak of 120 volts, then the equivalent battery would only need to have 120 volts divided by square root of two, which is about 90 volts. Let me get the exact value divided by square root of two. About 85 volts. Okay, so if you put a if you put a DC motor that's producing up to 120 volts on, sorry, an AC generator producing up to 120 volts, then you get just as much power out of an 85 volt battery. So, given that what we really care about is power, and given that we don't have most of our devices don't work on like a 50 times per second scale time scale. Most of our things we use are like electric blankets. So like, it doesn't matter if like if, if it's hot for one fiftieth of a second and then cold for another for one fiftieth, it's the average over time that matters. Given that when we quote the power, the amount of energy, the, the voltage of a AC current, we always quote this value here. Right, we quote the RMS value. So when we say that electrical plugs in Australia are 240 volts, what we really mean is that the RMS value is 240 volts. The peak value, the total, the, the maximum amount of voltage that Australian plugs put out is more like 350 volts. But they're varying constantly between zero 350, zero, negative 350, zero, 350, zero, et cetera. So on average, they're putting out 240 volts. That's what we mean when we say 240 volts out of an Australian plug. And the same with American plugs putting out 110 volts. So you can't boil with tea. Um, they're not really putting out 110 volts. They're putting out 190 volts sometimes and zero volts at other times. It's just on average, they're putting out 110 volts. Um, so that's how we measure electricity. The, the, the things that you need to be able to do here are kind of one, vaguely describe that process and it's all there in the name, root mean square. So you take the root of the mean of the square. If you can say that, then you've got the marks. Um, and just relate those two values to each other. So if somebody gives you a peak value, before you do anything with it, turn it into an RMS value. The RMS value is always the one that you're gonna use when you're doing your circuit analysis because it's the one that's telling you what the equivalent battery would be. Okay. How are we feeling about that? I'm cooked. Cooked? Yeah. Okay. Um, do, hold on, let me just look at the time. 30, 45, 45. Okay, we've got 15 minutes left in this class. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to write up a quick, like just summary of what you need to know, the bare minimum of what you need to know there for a couple of minutes before we move on to anything else. So you can sort of give your brain a little bit of a rest. Right. So
That's a brief summary of all you really need to take away from this. So when you're describing AC electricity, you're going to measure voltage two ways. You've got your peak voltage. That's the maximum amount of EMF you're ever putting out. And that's sort of, that's the amplitude of your sine graph. Then you've got your root mean square voltage, which is the effective voltage. It tells you how much power we're getting over time out of this supply. And it, if you were to replace your generator with a battery, that's the voltage of battery you would need to match in terms of making everything work the way it should and putting out the right amount of energy. Okay. For ideal AC electricity, there's a nice relationship between these two things. It's fairly straightforward to derive as long as you know how to integrate a sine graph. Um, and it's square root of two. The peak is square root of two times bigger than the root means than the average. Um, the commonest mistake in the world is to accidentally divide by root two or accidentally multiply by root two when you should be doing the reverse. Just always have that mental check in your mind. The peak needs to be the big one. <laughs> Like obviously the peak is the biggest it can be. The RMS is an average, so it's always smaller than the maximum. All right. And then before you do any calculations, you always make, need to make sure you're using the RMS value. The RMS value is the one that, sorry, someone's just come to my door with the package. That's right. I think my partner's got it. Um, the RMS value is the one that, you know, you can start just, you can use Ohm's law with, and you can do all your normal calculations. You can do all your year 11 stuff, as long as you're using your RMS value. Okay. I'll let you write that down. Um, and then I'll just, I might just briefly sketch out what we would do for the transmission problem, but we won't, I won't overload you now. Can you give me a thumbs up when you got that? Okay, all right. So how the hell does AC solve that transmission problem? How do I not have any blank paper? Okay, so we have the transmission problem. So the, the basic problem is any load that you want to use locally is always going to be in the electricity always needs to pass through the wires before it can get to you. So there is an RW as well as an R load in your circuit, even in the very simplest case, right? The problem there is that we need to get a certain amount of power out over here. So let's say you need um, 2,400 watts over here, right? And you want to achieve that by putting 240 volts on. Well, then you're going to need an amp of current, right? You're going to need 
you know, VI gives you your power, right? Well, if this thing here is even not a huge resistor, if you're trying to put, pull an amp through, an amp's a lot of electricity and the, and the cable's coming from the Latrobe Valley are carrying a lot more than an amp. If you're trying to pull an amp of electricity through, then let's say that's a 20 ohm resistor. Well, then it's gonna use up 20 volts, but it's not a 20 ohm resistor. It's a 200 ohm resistor. Uh, if that's a 200 ohm resistor, then it's going to pull 200 volts. Two hundred volts are going to get dropped on that resistor. So that means almost half the energy that you're pulling, almost half the voltage that you're pumping in, that means you're going to have to put on a 440 volt battery at this end here. Almost half the voltage that you're putting in is getting lost just in the wires. So you're having to put double the amount of energy in that you would otherwise have to, right? Per electron. So what we want to do is we want to find a way to put through or to have as little energy lost on this resistor as possible. Right? So what we would like to do is somehow and how do you work out how much energy has been lost here? Well, I told you we're never going to use that P equals V squared on R. The way we want to work out power being lost on a resistor is P equals I squared R. Okay, so that's just P equals IV, but then I've replaced the I, I've replaced the V with V equals IR. So P equals IV, but then V equals IR, so that's I, I R, I squared R. Hopefully you remember that from year 11. The power, so, uh, yes? Um, for the current of the circuit, shouldn't it be 10 amps? Because it's 2400 divided by 240. Oh yeah, sorry, oh, even worse. Yeah, sorry, 10 amps. Right. Just to keep things, just to keep me from having to recalculate things, that's like that a 20 ohm resistor. Thank you. Um, so we got 10 amps going through a 20 ohm resistor because it's 200 volts. All right. So the power being lost here is I squared R, right? Now the reason we use I squared R is we don't want a V in there because if you put a V in there, you are always going to be tempted to use this V. But because we're in a series circuit, that resistor is not using the full 440 volts. It's using some fraction of it. But as soon as you put a V in this, in this formula here, you're going to be in an exam. You're going to be panicking. You're like, I know power's IV. Where can I see a V? Oh, there it is. It's on the supply, 440. I'm just going to plug that in. You don't want to do that, right? Because this resistor is not getting to 440 volts. It's only getting 200. So you want to use I squared R. Whenever you're calculating the drop of the power being put out by a resistor, you're using I squared R. I cannot stress this enough. Okay, so how do you keep, how do you keep power loss down? You keep I needs to be small. Okay, well, I mean, that seems, yeah, okay. But if I is small, well then, you're not going to have much power. You, P over here is also equal to I squared R. P in your load. So this is P lost in your wires, but this is P in your load. That's also I squared R. And so if we have a small I over here, we can have a small I over here. Huh. So it doesn't seem, it seems pretty pointless to keep that I small. So here's what we do. We use an AC source. And then we put in a special little element to our circuit called a transformer. Okay. And, and then 
the electricity goes through this sort of middle circuit that has the, the transformer in it. And then we send it to another transformer. Okay, so we've replaced the whole middle cert, middle part of our circuit with this weird disconnected bit. And notice that the diagram tells the story here. This is one circuit, this is a second circuit, and this is a third circuit. Okay, here's what a transformer does. Let's say you're putting out 240 volts here and 10 amps. That means you're putting out a total of 2,400 watts from your, um, from your generator. What a transformer can do is it can trade off voltage for current or, volt or current or vice versa. So what a, so we're pumping in 240 volts and 10 amps on this side. What it can do is it can turn that into 2,000, let's say, 2,400 volts out and only one amp. Or 4,800 and half an amp. Or 24,000 and point one of an amp. So the to same total amount of power... but a transformer is a special electrical component that lets you use the same amount of power, but change the voltage current mix. Okay, now instead of having 10 amps going through our resistor, we're gonna have only one amp going through our resistor over here. Okay, that seems good. So we have 10 amps here, we only have one amp here, that's gonna reduce the amount of power being consumed by this in these wires. And then what we're gonna do is when we get back to this transformer, we're going to just take, take it back. We're just gonna change the mix back again. So when we get back to this transformer, we're gonna pump up the current and pump down the volume. Now we can't change the total amount of energy. Energy is conserved in the universe. So we can't, we can't create any energy out of nowhere or lose energy, but we can change the mix between voltage and current. So suddenly we're gonna have 10 amps again at this end. And so the I squared R on this one becomes big again. So P on this one goes down while P on this one stays steady. And that means we don't lose nearly as much current from our, sorry, we don't lose, lose nearly as much energy from our system in these wires. Okay. Now, the whole, this whole unit, this whole electromagnetism unit, the outcome according to the VCAA is that you need to be able to, at the end of this unit, describe a system like this and calculate everything out of it. So they, they're gonna give you a generator. It's got this many coils. It's winding this fast. Here's, you know, work out how much voltage it's putting out, etc. Okay, we're gonna put it into this sort of system and you're gonna to have to work out how much energy is lost and how much energy you end up getting at the end and the voltage that comes out at the end and how much current and all these sorts of things. But, and so, you might remember year 11 physics, year 11 electrical circuits with um, not particularly fond memories <laughs> because uh, it was probably the hardest bit of the year. It was probably the thing that people struggled with the most. But, oh, actually, you guys did way better than previous years from memory. So maybe you guys aren't as scared of this as, um, anyway. But we only really have to understand one circuit, this circuit, okay? If we, can, if we, we just do this circuit to death, and you will understand it, and then we'll be done. Okay. The only, so here's what we're doing over the next week. We're gonna look at how the hell this transformer does the job that it does. How does it take electricity, which has 240 volts and 10 amps, and turn it into some other mix of voltage and current? 
right? How does it actually do that job? So we're going to look at that. And then we're going to do dozens and dozens of these circuits with different inputs and different outputs and all sorts. And you're going to get really, really good at being able to work out how this much energy is getting lost here and here's where that's going and so forth. Okay. So that's where we're going over the next week or two. All right.